Hello and welcome to Math 200 Lecture Series for Kenyatta College. We are using PowerPoint presentations created from Mario Triola's textbook, Essentials of Statistics, 5th edition. My name is Ray Lapus. We are now in Chapter 7, Estimates and Sample Sizes. Just a quick review, back in chapters 2 and 3 we studied descriptive statistics where we found the basic statistics like the means and standard deviations. We graphed things and uh, we collected the basic statistics from a data set. In chapter 6 we introduced critical values and critical values are those Z values uh, that we found using the normal distribution. Somewhere in between there also we studied some probability and the probability was incorporated in chapter 6. So this chapter will mark the beginning of our study of inferential statistics. So we have two main ideas for inferential statistics. One of them is to estimate a value of a population parameter. The other is to test a claim about the value of a population parameter. So we'll introduce these methods of estimating in this chapter and we will work on the parameters of proportion, means, and standard deviations. We'll also be looking at how to determine a sample size so that you can study and estimate these parameters. Section 7-2, Estimating a Population Proportion. The idea in this section is to use a sample to estimate the population proportion. So we'll study this thing called the point estimate. We will study these things called confidence intervals. And we will look at how to find a good sample size so that our estimate would be statistically sound. Here's a definition. A point estimate is a single value or a point used to approximate a population parameter. For example, if we're talking about a proportion, the best estimate for a popula population proportion P would be the sample proportion and the sample proportion we refer to as P hat. Let's take a look at an example. A research center conducted a survey of 1,007 adults and they found that 85% of them know what Twitter is. So this is a sample proportion and the best point estimate for the population proportion P will have to be the sample proportion. Now let's define confidence interval. The confidence interval is a range of values used to estimate the true value of the population parameter. So we sometimes call it CI for confidence interval. When we're dealing with confidence intervals, the idea of a confidence level will be important for us. So it's a probability 1 minus alpha that the confidence interval actually does contain the population parameter. So assuming that the estimation process is repeated a large number of times. The confidence level is also known as the degree of confidence. So our ideas for confidence levels would be 
90%, 95%, or 99%. The way we interpret a confidence interval will be important as well. So we want to make sure that the idea is that our confidence interval is trying to capture some population proportion or population parameter. We usually write our confidence interval as a set of inequalities. We have a number less than whatever the population parameter is less than another number. So in an example where we have 0 0.828 less than p less than 0 0.72 and if we found this confidence interval with a 95 percent confidence we would say that we are 95 percent confident that the interval from 0 0.828 to 0 0.872 actually does contain the true value of the population proportion now it's not guaranteed, that's why we say it's 95% confident. So this means that another interpretation for this is that if we select many different sample sizes or many different samples of the same size 1007 and we make confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals, then we should get about 95% of them to actually contain the true population proportion. So this is how we will want to write our confidence interval. So we want to focus on this phrase that we are 95% confident that the interval from whatever the two numbers are actually does contain the true value of the population proportion. So it's important that we in, in, interpret this properly. Uh, confidence intervals can be used informally to compare data sets, but overlapping of confidence intervals should not be used for making formal or final conclusions about the two proportions being equal. You can also use confidence intervals to help test a claim about a population proportion. So this whole idea of a hypothesis test will come around next chapter. So we'll focus on that next time. Another important definition in inferential statistics is the idea of a critical value. So in our particular situation with the population proportion, we will be using the standard z-score. So a z-score can be used to distinguish between a sample statistic that's likely to occur than those that are unlikely. So this is like a boundary for us to figure out when things would occur. So under certain conditions, the sampling distribution of a sample proportion can be approximated by a normal distribution. And a z-score associated with a sample proportion has a probability of alpha over 2 of falling in the right tail. Well, what's a tail? The z-score separates the right tail region is most commonly denoted as z sub alpha over 2 and this is the critical value. It is a borderline separating the z-score from the sample proportions that's likely to occur. So if we think about the value in the green under this curve, this is where our confidence interval would live. Everything in here would be a usual value for us. Anything outside in the tail would be out of bounds or unusual. So a critical value is a number on the borderline that separates the sample statistics that are likely to occur from those that are unlikely to occur. Now that z-score is happening on the right side, the z sub alpha over 2, but since we are talking about the standard normal distribution,
there is also a critical value on the left side, but that is simply a mirror image about the zero, z is equal to zero, so that would be a negative value of the critical value. We will be most concerned with the right side critical value. So we talked about our popular confidence level being 90%, 95%, 99%. We have a corresponding alpha probability with each of those confidence levels. And then it turns out that we have some values to try to remember or be able to look up. So the critical value for a 90 uh, the critical value for a 90% confidence is going to be 1.645 we will be using 95% confidence level quite a bit and so the critical value for the z sub alpha over 2 for that is going to be 1.96 so another important definition for confidence intervals would be the margin of error so the margin of error denoted by e is a maximum likely difference with the probability 1, 1 minus alpha uh, between the observed proportion and the true value of the population. So think about the margin of error when you take polls and then somebody says that 75% agree to something and then they say plus or minus some margin of error. So that plus and minus business is going to be the margin of error. We have a formula for this. The margin of error for proportions is going to be given by this equation. E is equal to z sub alpha over 2 times the square root of p hat times q hat over n. So p is the population proportion. That's what you, that's what you are estimating. The p hat is the proportion of the sample that you collected. Now the q or q hat is going to be the complement of the sample proportion. So for example if p hat was 75 percent then q hat would be 25 percent. So it's the complement. n is the number of sample values and e is the margin of error. Now z sub alpha over 2 would be that z-score separating the area of alpha over 2 in the right tail. Again, we have some common z-values that would be easy for us to use. And when things get more complicated, we can use the calculator. In fact, we can use the inverse norm in our calculator to find the other non-standard z-values. So here are the steps <clears throat> so here are the ideas for the confidence interval when we want to estimate a population proportion some criteria number one we want to make sure the sample is simple and random number two the conditions for the binomial distribution is satisfied so we have a fixed number of trials, that's going to be n. The trials are independent. There are two categories for the outcomes, the failure or success, and then the probabilities remain constant. So that's our p hat. There are at least five successes and five failures. So if your sample is too small, then this idea of building a confidence interval for a proportion won't make too much sense. So we already know about the margin of error. To, co to complete our confidence interval, we take our estimate. So remember that we're estimating p, the population proportion. And to do that, we would take our sample estimate, p hat, and then we subtract the margin of error, and then we add the margin of error. Another way to write this would be p hat plus or minus your margin of error, which is the common phrase that we hear a lot 
when we're looking at poles. Another way to write this is using a parentheses notation, open parentheses, your p hat minus the margin of error as your left bound, and then your p hat plus the margin of error as your right bound. In general, with proportions or probabilities, we want to round off to three significant digits. Four won't hurt either, so I think the more digits, the better. Here is a textbook's procedure for constructing a confidence interval. We will change this a little bit and focus on using the calculator. But let's read through this and see what they have to say. Uh, first, we want to verify that the required assumptions are satisfied. We want to make sure that the sample is simple and random. We want to make sure that this is essentially a binomial distribution experiment. And we want to make sure that uh, there's at least five um, failures and successes. So another way to check for that would be the n times p is bigger than or equal to 5 and q n times q or is also bigger than or equal to 5. So here is where they start using the table and the formulas. Step 2, we're going to refer to table A2 and find a critical value. Step 3, we're going to calculate the margin of error. Step four, after we get the margin of error, we're going to add and subtract that value from p hat. And then step five, we're going to round off to three significant digits. Let's take a look at an example. In the charter problem that we noted in the Pew Research Center poll of 1,007 randomly selected adults, showed that 85% of the respondents know what Twitter is. So the sample results are n is equal to 1007 and p hat is equal to 0.85. That is our sample. They want us to find the margin of error that corresponds to the 95% confidence level, find a 95% confidence interval estimate of the population proportion p. And then they ask a question, based on the results, can we safely conclude that more than 75% of adults know what Twitter is. Now, I know 75% is bigger than 85%, but we want to know if it's significantly larger. And then the last question, assuming you're a newspaper reporter, write a brief statement that accurately describes the results and includes all the relevant information. So let's do a requirement check first. We have to assume that the, the sample is simple and random. And we have a fixed number of trials, that's 1,007. We're going to assume that the trials are independent. Uh, there's two possible outcomes per trial. That is, either you know Twitter or you don't. The probability remains constant. That's a probability of 0.85. And note that the number of successes and failures are both at least 5. So you can get that by multiplying uh, 1,007 by 0.85 and 1,007 by the q, uh, the q hat, which is 0.15. So now let's use a formula to find a margin of error. Our z sub alpha over 2 is 1.96. And we have 1.96 times the square root of p hat, which is 0.85. q hat is the complement. That's 0.15. And then divided by n. So if you punch that in your calculator, you get 0 0.022, so about 2.2 2 percentage, 2 .2 percentage points. To create our confidence interval, we're going to take that margin of error value that we got and add and subtract it from the p hat, which is 0.85. So on the left side, we'll have 0.85 minus 0 0.022. On the right side, we have 0.85 plus 0 0.022. And then we got our confidence interval to be between 0.828 to 0.872. Now to try to answer this question, based on our confidence interval, uh, is it look like we have more than 75%? So our limits start at 0.828, which is about 
and then it goes higher after that. So we're clearly greater, we're clearly above 75%. So it does look like it appears that the population proportion is in fact greater than 75%. And then now we're asked to try to summarize this statement. We can say that 85% of US adults know what Twitter is. And that's, uh, we can say 85% plus or minus two percentage points. And then we can say that with 95% confidence. So here's another way to restate that. In theory, in 95 such polls, 95% of such polls, a percentage point should differ by no more than 2.2 percentage points in either direction of the percentage that we would f be found by interviewing all adults in the United States. Okay, let's backtrack a little bit and take a look at this original problem. This time we'll attack it using the calculator. We'll take our calculator and we will go to stat, tests, and this is a proportion. It's actually one proportion. So I'm going to scroll down until I see one prop Z int. So this is a confidence interval. So that's the INT part, interval. It's a proportion and it has one sample. So I'll select that, and then it's asking for an X, an N, and a confidence level. So the X is going to be 85% of the total. So I'm going to type that in, 0.85 times the total, which is 1,007. And if I press Enter, I'll see that the number is 855.95. Now the calculator is not going to like this because it's expecting a whole number for X and N. So we can assume that when they got 85% in their calculations that they rounded off. So we have to go back and round this off as well. So I have 855.95. So I'm going to round off to the nearest whole number. So that's going to make this 856. Now the next thing that they're asking for is the sample size n. And so that's 1007. And then finally, it's looking for a confidence level. And the confidence level that we're looking at is a 95% confidence level. So I'll type 0.95. OK. Let's ask it to calculate. And hopefully, we get the same answers that they did. Let me move this over and take a look at the answers that they got. So this is the confidence interval. So they got 0.828 to 0.872, we have 0 0.828, 0 0.8721. So it looks like we hit the mark and we got the same correct answer. Now that was a lot easier than the steps that they took here. So now the question is that if you have a confidence interval, can you go back and recover the margin of error or even the point estimate? So the answer is yes, and it's just a matter of going backwards in your formula. A little bit of algebra and arithmetic would help that. Or you can think about it as just requiring a formula. So let's skip to the formula. If you have a confidence interval that's either given or something that you found, and then you want to find the point estimate or the margin of error, then you can just use this formula. So the confidence interval is going to be a set of two numbers and the point estimate is the number right in the middle. 
So we essentially have the upper confidence limit plus the lower confidence limit divided by 2. That's the average between those two numbers. The margin of error is half of the distance from the upper and the lower confidence limits. So if you subtract the two confidence interval limits, that would be the length of the confidence interval and then you divide that by 2, then you would get half of that length, which is exactly what you're looking for. So that's how you would find the point estimate in the confidence interval if you already, I'm sorry, that's where you would find the, co the point estimate and the margin of error if you're given the confidence interval. There's a couple of slides here that discuss analyzing poles. So let me just read that through. When you're analyzing poles, you want to consider that the sample should be simple and random. And so let's think about uh, like political polls and who's voting and things like that. So if you don't, if your if your sample is not simple and random, then you're going to have a bias that's going to skew your data. Uh, we want the confidence level to be provided and a lot of times we use 95 percent but uh, when when the media reports this a lot of times they don't mention your confidence level so when you do it make sure you include the confidence level uh, the sample shot size should be provided a lot of times that's not provided either a very small sample size might not provide a good representation of the population so always try to look for the sample sizes and then for except for relatively rare cases the quality of the poll results in some sampling methods that the sample size and population is not usually a factor so one more caution here uh, we shouldn't follow the common misconception that the poll results are unreliable if the sample size is too small because there's something to be said about uh, the, the, the techniques that they use. Population, population size is usually not a factor in determining a reliable poll. Uh, what's more important is that you get a good representation in your, in your study. We're going to shift gears now and talk about finding sample sizes. So suppose you want to study a particular situation and you want to know how big your sample should be. So how many should you, how many people sh you should pull or how many things you should count so that your, your study is going to be reliable. So that is a determining your n your n is your sample size and uh, that's what people usually say is we want to find our n so what we're going to do is we're going to start with our margin of error formula and we're going to work backwards we're essentially going to want to solve for n and so it's literally literally just some algebra. So with some algebra we're going to get a formula like this. So we aim to get z sub alpha over 2 squared. So that's our critical value. We have p hat times q hat and then we're going to divide that by our conceived margin of error and then we're going to square it. So it turns out that uh, to find our sample size um, we want to estimate there's going to be two formulas involved here one would be a formula if you know a, a an estimate p hat then you can use that formula where p hat and q hat are involved just as the formula that we solved for in the previous slide now there's going to be some studies where you're not going to know what p hat is equal to because you've never done a study in this particular area. And so when that happens, 
we're going to assume that p hat is going to be 0.5 and so p hat times q hat is 0.5 times 0.5 so that's 0.25 it turns out that this sample size will be larger because you just want to be a little bit safer by having a larger sample size now the round off rule for this is uh, is tricky and you want to make sure that when you've found your sample size um, you are probably going to get some decimal and what you want to do is you always want to round up to the next larger whole number let's do a couple of quick examples here we have companies are interested in knowing the percentage of adults who buy clothing online so how many adults should you survey in order to be 95 percent confident that the sample percentage is in error by no more than three percentage points so here's two different scenarios one of them is using a recent study by the Census Bureau that 66 percent of the adults buy clothing online so the 66% will serve as our p hat. Now that's uh, different from our second example where we have no prior information. So let's see these two scenarios play out. So for the first one, we're going to assume that 66% is our p hat. And so we find our q hat, and that's going to be 34%. So we got p hat is 0.66, q hat is 0.34. Our degree, our confidence level is 95% confidence level, so alpha is 0.05. And when alpha is 0.05, we have our critical value to be 1.96. They also snuck in the information about your margin of error of no th more than three percentage points. Now that we have all that, let's plug it into the formula. And when we plug it into the formula, we're going to get 957.839 now our round off rule tells us to round up and so we got our solution to be n is equal to 958 that means if we want to be 95 percent confident that our sample percentage is within three percentage points of the true percentage of all adults then we need to find a simple random sample of 958 adults. Let's compare this to our other scenario where we didn't know of any other studies previously done. And so we will not assume that our p hat is equal to whatever that percentage is. So we'll start with the basics. We have our alpha is 0.05 again. So our critical point or critical value is z sub alpha over 2 equals 1.96. We still have a margin of error of 3 percentage points. And let's go ahead and plug that into our formula. Our formula that assumes that we don't know what p hat is, we'll assume that p hat times q hat is 0.25. So if we plug in those numbers, the critical value and the margin of error, we're going to get 1067.1111. Now remember that you always round up. Usually when you have a number less than 5, you keep it the same. But remember our round off rule for finding the sample size n, we always round up. So we got 1068. What does that say? That says, if we want to be 95% confident that our sample percentage is within three percentage points of the true percentage of all adults, we should obtain a simple random sample of 1,068 adults. So by having at least 1,068 adults, we can be 95% confident that we are, we are within three percentage points. Notice also that this value 1,068 is larger than the other value that we had, about 900 and something. So uh, if we don't have prior information about a survey being done, then 
we have to settle for a larger sample size. Okay, that is the end of section 7-2.